Right. Um, so the topic of tonight is uh, how to shape the future. And because I'm a uh, computer scientist, uh, so something that we are working on on our research team right now in Strasbourg University is to think on how it is possible to make computers, to make them autonomous, to, to have some creative autonomous computers. So, in order to uh, understand how this can happen, um, it can happen through the mix of two things, which is AI, AI is artificial intelligence, but also artificial evolution. Most people don't know that uh, uh, in parallel with the development of AI, uh, artificial evolution has also developed. So if you look at uh, a timeline on how computers have, and, and research on these domains have been uh, uh, going on. Well, 1953 is more or less the first business computer, the IBM 650. Okay, and you see that artificial intelligence developed in 1955, 1956, and so on. So it was what some of the very, very first algorithms uh, that have been developed on computers were of, on artificial intelligence. But of course, the very same uh, thing that has been uh, puzzling people is about evolution. So if you, in, in 1953, you've got first trials in Australia, USA, and Europe. In 1957, uh, chains of bits have been evolved by Fraser, and you go on like this. And those two technologies have uh, um, come, up, uh, come of age. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, it has been sooner in artificial evolution than in artificial intelligence. Ever since the years 2000 now, we have human competitive computers, uh, algorithms, that are capable of creating, of innovating, creating, get, uh, imagining new solutions that had never been thought about before by human beings. Um, and since 2009, there's a, there has been an, another revolution, which is the advent of uh, um, graphic processing units. These are massively parallel um, um, chips on which you have several thousands of cores that can work in parallel, all right? But the only problem is that you need to have the right algorithms in order to be able to exploit them. And artificial evolution is one of them. And in parallel, um, artificial intelligence is also one of the type of uh, algorithms that can exploit these GPUs with, in 2012, the, uh, the, the advent of uh, deep learning. So for those of you who, have not, who don't know about deep learning yet and who don't know what deep learning is capable of doing, here are a couple of examples. Um, so the state of the art here is deep learning has been developed by Yann Lequin. Um, and here is typically what comes up if the video is coming. Yeah. So, this is what a computer is capable is of doing right now. Yes. What is the man doing? Typing. Is the baby sitting on his lap? Yes. Are they smiling? Yes. Is there a baby in the photo? Yes. Where is the baby standing? Bathroom. What is the baby doing? Brushing teeth. What game is being played? Soccer. Is someone kicking the ball? Yes. What color is the ball? Yellow. What game is the dog playing? Frisbee. What color is the dog? Black. Is the dog wearing a collar? Yes. What is the cat sniffing? Banana. Where is the cat? On bed. What color is the cat? Black and white. What color are the bananas? Green. Okay, all this is being done in real time. Um, it is, uh, that's the current state of the art of uh, deep learning, as it is called, which is 
uh, uh, what has been developed by Facebook through Yann Lequin. This is one of his uh, uh, achievements. But also, uh, the problem is that you can have uh, some big problems too, because now you have Google Photos that is using the same technology with sometimes uh, some uh, bad labeling on, on some photos. Um, but then, so not only is, it, is this working on photos, but it's also working on videos. Here you're just um, uh, looking for people, all right? The computer is automatically detecting the people, but not only it is is it uh, capable of detecting people, it's also capable of detecting any kind of other things. So you can take um, a computer for a walk, you know, in town, and so this is the analysis of the computer, a man in a suit and a tie hold standing in front of a building. Of course, it's not a tie, so the computer makes some mistakes, but you can see that the zip uh, could really be mistaken for a tie. Here, a sign on the wall that says, unk, 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 it's trying to read the sign. Uh, a man is walking down the street uh, with a cell phone in front of a building. Of course, the thing makes mistakes, but roughly, you know, it, 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 it gets an idea on what is happening. And this is, again, uh, current technology. So this is what AI is currently capable of doing. Um, and not only does it happen to, does it apply to images, does it apply to videos, but also it applies to text, to speech, um, and roughly everything that is around here. So, um, for those of you who have been looking old movies, uh, here is a movie that was considered as being science fiction, complete science fiction, uh, back in the 90s. Some of you will recognize it. That's the term Terminator. Okay, he just arrived on Earth, and he's looking for some things to, some uh, clothing. So he's trying, he's analyzing all the people that he sees, because he, you know, he needs to, to find someone who, that matches uh, uh, his gait. And apparently this guy is matching it, you know. So <clears throat> probably this, uh, this guy has uh, uh, clothes that he could put on. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> So that's the conversation. You forgot to say please. You forgot to say please. That was a wrong answer from a human. Uh, because if you look at what happens to him next, uh, this is exactly is not what he should have, what he should have answered. So here, uh, the Terminator was a an autonomous computer. And what made it autonomous? First of all, it was capable of analyzing what was around it, understanding what was happening. And what you see is that what was total science fiction at this time uh, in the, the domain of recognizing what is happening around it, this is exactly what we have right now. All right? Now, what is missing in order to get an autonomous computer? It is the ability for a computer to be able to find solutions on its own to problems that have appeared. Um, <clears throat> so, what is autonomy? One of the definitions of autonomy is, could be the ability to solve a problem on your own. And it's here that artificial evolution comes in. Um, before speaking of artificial evolution, what is evolution first? We could define it uh, in the following way, in a dynamic environment, where multiple coexisting species and individuals evolve, uh, thanks to random mutations, the selection of the best creates uh, some new species that are emergent and that are able to solve the problem of surviving, adapting uh, to the current conditions. So if you look at what is happening in nature, nature is extremely inventive. You have some very improbable uh, animals around here. One of those that I really like is the uh, Opistoproctidae. Uh, it's a fish that is uh, a deep sea fish. And uh, what you may think are its size are not its size. It's the gills. This is where it breathes, the two uh, black spots in front. And in fact, its eyes, this is not a drawing, by the way, it's a picture. Okay, it's a living animal. It's taken from a video. The eyes are the uh, semispheres, the green semispheres that are looking up, okay, and the fish is looking up through its transparent skull because it's a deep sea fish that is uh, hunting for other, for, for other fish. And 
typically, it looks up, it keeps looking up in order to find, to, to, to see if there's a shadow uh, of another fish that is uh, uh, swimming just over it. And if there's a shadow, the fish would swim up. The eyes swivel in front in order to be able to catch its prey. So you see that nature can be extremely inventive in order to, to find uh, um, ways to adapt and, and, and for, for these uh, animals to survive. So the question is, can we use evolution for our own purposes? And if can, could, be, could we be uh, implementing evolution into computers in, in order to create artificial evolution? So this is what has been happening ever since the 1950s, the second timeline that I described. Um, you start with a population that you initialize. Uh, and as soon as you have a population of potential solutions to the problem, you just evaluate them. And this is what we call parents. Parents are solutions that have been evaluated. You know whether they are good or not. Now, once you have this population of parents, um, well, first of all, you, have a, you, you try to see if one of them is solving the problem. If it's the case, then you stop there and you pick up the best of the population to, uh, that would be the best solution to your problem. Um, but if not, then you select n parents and you have these different parents, which are potential solutions to your problem. You, you, you cross them over, you, you mutate them, you have variation operators, and through those variation operators, you create a population of children. And once you have this population of children, you'll evaluate them, then you get parents and children that you reduce through a replacement phase, and well, here you are. You have, you have evolution inside a computer. And once you get this, well, you get creative computers. Um, this is, uh, these are creatures that have been evolved by uh, Carl Sims back in 1994. And the idea was to find uh, creatures that could uh, swim. So the computer has blocks. It can assemble the blocks, can move the blocks around. And the idea is, is to have the computer find a way to swim uh, as efficiently as possible. Now, some of them, you, you see some, some gates that, that you can find in nature that the, the computer has been able to find on its own. Uh, like these, you know, looking like sperm. Um, or, and then this would be how, to, how you would run on a surface that would not be on a fluid anymore, uh, but on a solid surface. But then, of course, you, these are very old uh, works. You can see how the evolution creates, for instance, a marching cube. So you start with a cube, which has muscles, which has uh, bones, which has uh, uh, fat cells. And this is the result, one of, of the resulting gates. That's another way for a cube to walk that has been evolved. Here again, the programmer didn't program any of this behavior. It is the computer that came up with the behavior through uh, evolving steps. Um, so these are toy pro problems, but what could, how could we be using them for real? Uh, this is an example with the ST5 project uh, at NASA by Jason Lone. The idea now is that you have satellites that are microsatellites, really small, but because they're really small, they don't have uh, uh, much batteries. They, they are very, they're not powerful at all, and they have to transmit back their data to the Earth. So either uh, you have an, uh, an antenna that is a single wire, in which case you have an omni omnidirectional antenna that emits through the whole uh, universe, and just you catch a very small part of the signal from the Earth, or you're trying to focus the signal towards a radio telescope. And if you're trying to focus the signal to a radio telescope, you, you had rather focus it so that you've got the exact surface of the radio telescope that is listening to the satellites, so that you don't waste any part of the signal because you have s such little energy to transmit with. The problem is that if you use standard antennas, uh, UDU Yuga models, uh, to, to, to model this, well, you could need an antenna that would be several meters long, or if you were using a parabola, the parabola would be much too large for the very tiny satellites that you're creating. So at some point, a way to do is to give artificial evolution the uh, Maxwell equations, to give a, uh, si uh, an antenna simulator to the computer and say, OK, please can you evolve an antenna that would be small enough to be compatible with the size of satellite, but ne well, that nevertheless would be able to focus enough the data towards the radio telescope. And after, I think it was three weeks of massively parallel computing using artificial evolution, this is the result that was obtained by computer scientists, uh, not 
antenna engineers, all right, because we can't see anything. That was what was found by the computer. And what's very interesting is that it is the computer that found this shape, very odd, very strange shape, very complex shape. And when this was shown to uh, the antenna engineers, they said, what is this? The computer scientists said, well, we don't know. The computer found this with your equations, with your simulators, right? Um, and what they did there then is, of course, test the antenna into an anechoic chamber. Um, it worked perfectly, and now they tested the second antenna with other um, uh, uh, constraints, and the computer came up with another antenna that was different, or maybe a third antenna, and the computer keeps coming up with antennas that are totally improbable, and when you just plug them on, they're working perfectly well. Um, in the end, so NASA had made a very small movie uh, to deploy the EST-5 mission, and I think that they at, at some point they said it was the first time a non-human technology was sent into space. Why is it non-human? It hasn't been designed by a human. It has been designed by a computer, uh, and you're not able to reproduce it. It's only computers that can do it. So the idea now is that if you imagine that artificial intelligence allows computers to spot out problems because it knows what is happening around it, um, then if it spots out a problem it has to solve in order to complete its mission, then uh, computers could use artificial evolution to find a way to complete the mission, to be inventive, to, to find a new solution. And so the, the next revolution to come in computer science could be to couple artificial intelligence and artificial evolution in order to have computers that are autonomous. Now, of course, um, there could be unexpected problems, and that was one expected problem. <laughs> it should have been zooming on the, on the bottom part of it. Um, because now we need to think of uh, a bit of philosophy. Um, and I had three sentences that were supposed to, to be printing just on the bottom of, uh, of the screen. The first sentence, sentence comes from a uh, French writer um, uh, who said that uh, scientists who should really, really think about what they're doing uh, and the real sentence, I just forgot it because it was just written there. Um, well, I'm not going to be remembering it. Um, it is Francois Rabelais, a French uh, uh, writer who said uh, that science is but the ruin of uh, the soul if you're not uh, uh, looking at what you're doing. Now, the second sentence was a very interesting one because it came from a very renowned scientist who said, well, if uh, we knew what we uh, were doing, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be calling this research, would we? And so, who has been saying this sentence? If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't be calling it research. It's just Einstein who said that. And finally, um, um, there is another uh, philosopher, uh, Levi Strauss, who said that a scientist is not here to give answers, a scientist is here to ask the right questions. So, finally, we are now in a stage where we can create autonomous computers. This is what we are doing in my team in Strasbourg University. But it is, we need to be very wary of what we are doing because these computers uh, can make mistakes. And if they do make, make mistakes, then they, they are autonomous, they can think of new solutions in order to, to circumvent the problems, and they will do it. And the, uh, the last, there was a very small video which was taken from uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, where you had HAL, the computer that was uh, uh, flying the ship, who computed that the, in order to fulfill its mission, um, there would be more probability for the computer to fulfill its mission without the human crew than with the human crew. So at some point in the movie, the computer decides to do away with the human crew because it computed that the probability for it to complete its mission would be better without the humans. So it proceeds in, into eliminating the humans. So you see that computers can become very inventive. And so now, the very last sentence by a great philosopher who is uh, Schopenhauer is that the task is not so much to see what no, what no one has yet seen, but to conceive what no one has yet imagined, but that everyone sees. So I'll let you ponder on this. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Pierre Collet.